Jesus said. Amen. You have your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. about this time of the year, many of us start getting a little frantic, don't we? Yep. Christmas is near. Uh, there's still so much to do. It gets frantic for many people, I think, this season. Uh, just the running around to the stores and trying to make ends meet. The season of Advent was supposed to be a chance for us to get ready. But in uh, a couple more weeks, it's all going to be over. Right now, we are, or you already have, if, if you're ahead of the game, already decorated your home. You've got the packages either still in the closet that need to be wrapped or in your favorite hiding place, wherever that is. Mercy has already discovered ours. <laughs> you know. You can't. I love this thing she comes out with. I hope you do. Who's this for? It's for a little girl. You don't know her. I had to lie to my child. That was not good. Lord, forgive me. Mercy is aptly named. <laughs> Last cards possibly have been sent. Ready or not, Christmas Day's coming, whether you like it or not. Are you prepared for Christmas? I mean the real Christmas. <laughs> not the Christmas of Santa Claus and reindeer and tinsel and expensive gifts. These kids are excited. They're ready. They'll let it get here. As wonderful as those things are, are you prepared for the birth of Christ? birth of the Christ child who sang this morning, The Way in the Manger. It's a beautiful song. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 gives us a formula for getting our hearts ready for Christmas. I want you to listen closely to his words from Philippians. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, <clears throat> by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that, church? It says that peace will guard your hearts and your minds. I think a lot of us, our minds are not at peace. Or a lot of us, our hearts are not at peace. If you're a control freak, your mind is at peace because you're holding on to the wheel, but your heart may not be. If life is seemingly out of control because of the business of the world, and you're a faithful Christian, you're walking with them, your heart may seem at peace, but your mind is racing 90 miles an hour. The scripture says your heart and your mind will be at peace in Christ Jesus. In these words, Paul gives us this comprehensive formula for finding peace in Christmas. A peace which, as he says, transcends all understanding. So let's consider a few moments the formula Paul gives us and see if it brings us peace during this Advent season. So let's begin with rejoice in the Lord always. Christmas is a time for joy. This is the third Advent which represents joy in the pink candle that was lit this morning. And in Paul's admonition uh, about rejoicing in the Lord always was no Pollyanna denial about the presence of the suffering world that, that occurs. We, we all know that stuff is happening in this world. You can turn on the news and you can see and be distressed when you go to sleep at night. Yeah. Amen? I mean, I, I turn on Fox News and I'm like, golly, can I... Can I turn it on one time and something happy be going on? Uh, the world is, is falling apart. There's wars. There's rumors of wars. There's all those things. But let me tell you something. That is written in the last book of the Bible. Amen. It says that's going to happen. It's going to happen. So get excited because Jesus is coming back just like he said he was. He says those things are going to happen all the way near the end. So just get ready for it and uh, understand I'm going to be on my way. 
Paul wrote his letter from prison, essentially on death row. He was in chains waiting to find out if he was going to be sentenced to death or if he was going to be let go. He had an amazing spirit, Paul. Three times he was shipwrecked. At least once he was stoned. And I don't mean stoned like in Colorado. <laughs> I mean stoned with real rocks. <laughs> Five times he was scourged and he was beaten many times as well. He been focused on the riots and the death threats, and after one harrowing near-death experience, he was snake bit. Yet these experiences could not take away his joy. Let me ask you a question this morning. This year, this month, last month, this week, has Satan tried to steal your joy? Mm -hmm. Can I hear an amen? Amen. I mean, listen, if you think for one moment Satan sleeps for eight hours a day, you're crazy. He has got you on his mind, and he wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin your relationships. He wants to take away your hope. He wants to take away your joy. He wants to take away everything that you hold precious so that he can get you to give up on this ridiculousness of who Jesus Christ is. But he is not ridiculous at all. History tells us that he exists. And there's insurmountable evidence that he did exactly what he said he did. We know that. We know historically he was resurrected from the dead. There's no denying that. So when he gives us the command, follow me, repent and be baptized, uh, we have to make a decision at this point in our life. Amen. Is he who he says he is? And am I going to submit to that and, and receive this joy and this peace that transcends all understanding? Or am I going to say, no thanks. I don't trust you quite that much. Wow. He makes it pretty black and white. Church, listen, the scripture is black and white. There's no gray area. It's obvious from Paul's example that joy doesn't does not mean everything is going to go our way. It's not going to be paths with petals of flowers that you can walk on. Joy does not mean receiving anything you desire in life. Joy doesn't mean having an enormous hall of goodies under your Christmas tree. Joy doesn't come from fame and prosperity. Joy doesn't Joy does come, however, from the inner, inner assurance that wherever or whatever you are going through, whether good times or bad, that God is with you. Amen. That's what he says. I know that joy is a difficult concept for some people, especially at Christmas. One of the most depressing facts about Christmas for these people is the fact that everybody else is so jolly. You ever meet those guys? Scrooge? And none of you know those guys, right? <laughs> they can't smile. Church, sometimes I gotta come to church and I gotta go like this to get a smile out of them. Because every day. <clears throat> Time is a game star. Move along, preacher boy. <laughs> Those persons have lost the ability to laugh, to play, even to rejoice in the Lord. They may not be misers, but they have a great deal of spirit of Scrooge in them. <laughs> Very much the Grinch that stole Christmas. Something in life has made them afraid. Watch this. Something in life has made them afraid to trust life. Something has made them afraid to, watch this church, trust people. Something has made them afraid, watch this church, to trust God. Now watch this derail. Watch this derail. Your relationship falls apart. And you say this. Where are you now, God? Why is my life like this? How can I trust? 
trust you. Look at what he just did. Look what she just did. Watch this. Your trust was never in Christ. It was in that person. Amen. And I promise you every single time it is going to hurt if you put your trust in a man. Do you understand? Church, catch this. God is not going to drop you. He's going to have you. He wants you, but he wants you to commit to him completely. You can't taste test God. Can I just get the Diet Coke of Jesus? Only one calorie? No. You have to have the real thing to steal Coke's phraseology. And you have to follow him completely. Let me ask you a question. What is stealing your joy? Why? Who have you put your trust in that your joy would be stolen when that person or those people or that thing fails? You will be disappointed every day of your life if you put your trust in things or other people when your trust needs to be solely in Christ. Dr. Raymond Moody put it this way in his book, Laugh After Laugh. It is well recognized that some persons are actually fearful of joy. They're fearful of elation, pleasure, or any, any other usually positive emotional states. These guys are just, uh, I like to call them eat horse, right? No poo. And they, can't lay, they can't make me happy about anything. They're just always going to walk around that way. They feel that these people, they, they, they have, many of these people are being joyful causes them to have feelings of guilt, shame, or unworthiness. Maybe you were raised in a home that way. You can't be happy because you don't deserve to be happy. How can you bring joy into a person's life that seems like it's impossible to bring joy? We have a prison ministry. Can one have or bring joy into a prison? Yes. You think? Yes. Let's see.
those daddies held his baby for the first time in his life. Can you bring joy into a place where there's no joy? Absolutely, if Christ is in the center of it. <laughs> That'd be a sad thing to be fearful of joy, to feel unworthy of experiencing happiness. Unfortunately, such feelings have crept into the attitudes of some of the followers of Christ. Some of the followers of Christ had an attitude when they were going in there or they were trying to minister. They, they had attitudes where they said, no, I am not going to like that. That dude is a Sumerian. You're not supposed to go into Samaria because they're a different race than we are. What are you doing, Mary, with that vial poured it all over Jesus' feet? Do you know that that costs an entire year's wages? You just wasted? Whoa, did you hear what that guy said? You just wasted pouring it on Christ's feet? Our priorities will dictate, watch this, our priorities will dictate our joy. Amen. That's true. And if Christ is your priority, you will have joy. If he is not your priority, if things are your priority, if a relationship is your priority, if a animosity or a grudge is your priority because you can't let it go and you want that person to come to you and ask for forgiveness first before you ever get a smile again. I promise you it's going to be a long time before you smile again. You turn the other cheek, you forgive them anyway, and you walk away, and you don't let that person steal your joy. Amen? Amen. We need to be reminded that our Puritan forefathers banned the celebration of Christmas as a frivolous pagan thing. Did you know that? The Puritans who came to our shore in America said, you ain't going to, we're not going to put a Christmas tree. We're not going to do that. That's a pagan thing. Now, they were partly right. A former Caesar was wanting to not have us celebrate the birth of Christ. I'm going to bum a bunch of you out. Because Christ was born around July. Technically, as we look at the scripture. Probably around that area, era, era, time of the, of the year. So what this Roman Caesar did is he moved the birth of Christ to a specific date on a pagan holiday that they knew a Roman god was born, <coughs> December 25th. And he said, I am mandating as Caesar that this is the day that you have to celebrate the birth of Christ. And they were like, Ugh. Let me, let me put it in 2015, right where you are. You would be, oh, this might be get ugly. <laughs> you pick the worst day that you would want to not celebrate in this country, and I'm going to change your birthday to that day. You're going to celebrate your birthday on the day that you think is the foulest day to celebrate in this country. And put your birthday on that day and now be mandated that you have to celebrate your birthday on that day. Would you fight? Yes. <laughs> A lot of people would fight. Watch what happened. On the first Christmas that is now mandated by Caesar, history tells us, he thought for sure the outcome would be Nobody would come out and celebrate it. But he was sorely mistaken. Every Christian in the first century church hit their knees. And they took that day and they celebrated Christ's birth anyway. Because there was no denying that Jesus Christ has come into this world to save it from sin. And he didn't steal their joy. He united them under the persecution of of that first church. Resentments hurt. People shut themselves out. They cannot experience the joy of Christmas because it will not let Christmas set them free. They need to be kind of like a young writer who came to 
uninhibited Zorba the Greek and said to him, teach me to dance. And if there was ever a time for dancing, it is at Christmas. The Lord of the heavens and the earth has come into our world as a tiny babe. What a supreme cause for celebration. People struggle, though, if uh, you're not supposed to dance and that's the way you were raised, that that would be a damper on what you would celebrate. Denominations struggle when they add things to the Ten Commandments. You don't dip, you don't chew, you don't date women who do. <laughs> you don't drink, you don't smoke. You don't do these things. Let's just add the list and make it go. You don't dance. You don't do those things. Well, let me tell you something. God loves you exactly the way you are. Amen. And as you walk with him, he's going to change you if you will allow him to move in your heart, in your life. Don't define Christ by rules that you have made or added to the scripture. You take God's word and you use it effectively to know truth. Because that is the only truth that can set you free. Well, next Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Now that's an interesting thought. Advent and Christmas are a time for gentleness. Unless, of course, you're headed for the mall. <laughs> and I don't see anything gentle happening over there. Amen. Some people have actually broken into fights over Christmas bargains. You see some of these ladies over there fighting over socks? I'm like, I don't know, I'm going to go near that table. <laughs> Others have been trampled by an avalanche of eager shoppers for Black Friday or whatever it's called. They're all standing out, camping out there. They got their tents on the sidewalk. I don't need a TV that bad to sit outside <laughs> in a tent. But people are going to do it because they've got priorities. I read about two nicely dressed women who were standing outside a department store and, and they were uh, having a conversation. The first lady was somewhat smug and she was from New York. No offense if anybody's from New York. She was married to a very wealthy man, and the second was a rather soft-spoken, gentle woman from the South. When the conversation centered on what they were expecting for Christmas, the wealthy woman started by saying, well, our first Christmas, my husband built me a magnificent mansion. <laughs> and the lady from the South commented, well, bless your heart. <laughs> The first woman continued on our second Christmas, my husband bought me a beautiful Mercedes Benz. Again, the lady from the South commented, well, bless your heart. <laughs> the first woman continued. Then on our third Christmas, my husband bought me this exquisite diamond bracelet. Yet again, the Southern lady commented, well, bless your heart. <laughs> the first woman then asked this lady, what did your husband buy you for your first Christmas? And the southern lady replied, My husband sent me to charm school. Charm school? The first woman said, amazed. What on earth for? Well, the southern lady responded, Well, for example, instead of saying, Who gives a darn? I say, Well, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleness may be a little difficult in the mad rush to seize it as we're out there. Just remember, well, bless your heart. <laughs> we don't often think of the gentleness of God, but how else can we think of the God at a Christmas time? We know that God's power and that he is a holy God, and how we think about his gentleness is a tough thing to sometimes get our minds wrapped around. Yet the same God who created the heavens and the earth came to one of us, he emptied himself and took on a human form, even the form of a tiny babe, and, and thought to, to be too amazing for us to comprehend. I love the way Mark Lowry wrote a song. Some of you know it. He put it into uh, this beautiful song, these words, Mary, Did You Know? You probably heard it on the radio or something. And he writes about how your baby boy has come to make you new. The child you delivered will soon deliver you. 
I particularly like the last two lines of this song where he says, did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you have kissed the face of God. How can we possibly get our minds around something like that? How can we possibly get our minds that this baby grows up to be a 30-year-old man and then he starts a ministry where he will end purposely at a cross at his choosing, knowing that you and I cannot save ourselves? And he says, I am choosing to die for you. Get your mind wrapped around this theologically. As the nails were hammered into his hands, your face and my face had to go through his mind so that he could say on the cross, it is finished. Kiss that baby. Watch this. In the prison, where I may or may not agree with what's going on in there, with what they're in there for, I held a baby who did not ask to be born into this world. And as I held that baby, as I watched my wife hold that baby, as I watched this guy who had never got to hold his baby, I realized that the only love that could be shown of Christ is the unconditional love that I would reflect to get this guy's mind wrapped around something that he has never been able to wrap his mind around. Watch this. We didn't get to pick our parents. We didn't get to pick those things out. We were born into this world and you were modeled possibly not necessarily the best things in life and possibly some good things. And if you get to live to be a ripe old age and I, you know, I'll reference Miss Inez's 90th birthday last week. God has allowed that woman to be on this earth for 90 years, God bless her, amen? amen. amen. I'll give you a clap. to church and she comes to church in a wheelchair and she makes her way to get here and her son with her in a wheelchair and they are faithfully there serving God day to day and week to week in their life and they are here. Now, now catch this. All they're doing is doing what God has called them to do. I want to hear what God has to say to me this morning. Sometimes we come to church because we think it's the Christian thing to do. And I promise you, you're going to get burnt out on that philosophy. But if you come to church to hear what God has to say to you this morning, Amen. and you listen to what God's word is, when you get a pang of conviction, know that it isn't the preacher speaking to you, but the Holy Spirit saying, hey, Sparky, right here, I'm talking to you. That's right. And that perhaps if we make adjustments, watch this. We make adjustments. Watch this, church. If we make adjustments and follow Christ, you may know joy possibly for the first time in your life. A joy that has eluded you for a long time. Let me give you an example of gentleness. True story. A soldier in the Israel army. He's on patrol in an area occupied by Palestine. He felt a rock strike him on the back. Then another and then another. He rolls around with his Uzi to take care of what he has had to take care of many times before. As he spins around, as oftentimes a soldier is trained, when you start undergoing fire and you reach for your weapon, your thumb flips, the, he flips off the safety and you spin and you are ready to react instinctively and pull the trigger. He's done this before. He has saved his own life by doing this. He's been trained very well. He flips the, flips the safety off and spins back to the aggressors. When he wheels around, he wheels around and sees three small children, two boys and a girl, throwing rocks at him because their parents have told them Israelites 
are filthy pigs and take the opportunity to hurt them when you can. And when he wheeled around to pull the trigger, the first one standing there was a five-year-old in a dress. He would not have gone to jail for pulling the trigger on all three children. He would have been self-defense and instinctiveness and it would have been wiped away. But he didn't squeeze the trigger. The little girl threw another rock and he let his weapon drop and he caught the rock with his hand. And then he held up his finger and he said, hold up. And he bends and he picks two of the rocks that were thrown at him up off the ground and he starts juggling. The kid's holding rocks in both of their hands are standing there looking at him. And he's juggling and he's doing little tricks and he continues to juggle the rocks. The children were mesmerized and forgot about their rocks they dropped on the ground. The soldier did a few more tricks and the children laughed. Then he did a grand finale and they applauded. And he took a bow and he walked away. The story could have had a different ending, couldn't it? We've seen con confrontations in our own land in the past few years that have had different endings, haven't we? But it doesn't have to be that way. We could have the gentleness of Christ, the gentleness that transforms anger to laughter, hatred to love. That's the kind of gentleness Paul is urging us to adopt in our own lives. And then he writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. No wonder Paul could rejoice even while waiting in prison at death row. No wonder when people oppressed him and abused him, when they beat him and said all manner of vile things to him, he could respond with a magnificent gentleness. He had learned life's greatest secret, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Henry Frost was a missionary to China. He was going through a difficult time in his life, and later he wrote these words in his journal. I had received sad news from home, and deep shadows have covered my soul. I prayed, but the darkness did not vanish. I summoned myself to endure, but the darkness only deepened, he writes in his journal. Then I went to an island station and saw on the wall of the mission home these words. Try Thanksgiving. And I did, he writes in his journal. And in a moment, every shadow was gone not to return. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone through a difficult time in your life when your spirits were struggling and you were about to give up? Did you ever try giving thanks even in the midst of your difficult times? Watch this. Most of us are taught not to do that. Most of us are taught to figure out the problem. Most of us, when we're confronted with ugliness and people are quitting on us or they're saying ugly things about us, we try to figure it out instinctively. But God says, Paul writes to us and says, just give thanks. And watch what God does. Think about this. Next time, try focusing on your blessings instead of focusing on your ills or on your negatives. You ever hear somebody say that? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings and see what God has done. Watch. God's working in your life, but we just tend to count the negatives more than we count the positives. It's so easy to be thankful at Christmas, isn't it? We have so much. We're gonna be rewarded with many nice things. The stores are filled with this year with symbols of, of all the material affluence that we need to see. 
But for some people, material influence only masks spiritual poverty. They grasp at things external because internally, we are poor. Scripture says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Could you give thanks this Christmas if some of the things you cherish most, watch this church, if some of the things you cherish most were stripped from you? Watch. How about your sight? How about your hearing? What about even your speech? I'm going to close with this story. There was a little girl in 1880. She was born in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Her name was Helen Keller. She came into this world without sight, without hearing, and without the ability to speak. If you read about this remarkable lady's life, you'll realize that she was born as a baby with no sight, no hearing, and unable to speak. You can't hear anything. You can't see anything. All you can feel is people touching you. Your brain, her brain is perfect in every way. All she could feel were hands on her or when she's helped and when she's not helped. She doesn't cry because she doesn't know how to cry. As a baby, she would lay there, as you read her story, just quiet, and her mother oftentimes wondered if she was even alive. What kind of blessing could this lady possibly be, have an effect on? Unable to see, unable to hear, unable to speak. What a dark world it was for this child. But one of the success stories of the ages is how Helen, Carol, uh, Helen Keller came out of this inner darkness into light, which you and I can only see as astonishment. Never seeing with physical eyes the light of the sun, what we see, never hearing the sounds that you and I hear, but she lived a full, rich, radiant life. Did you know that Helen Keller graduated from Radcliffe College, cum laude? Even more amazing, Though the course of, through the course of her life, she became close friends with kings and presidents and some of the most powerful and well-known people on earth. When her teacher, Ann Sullivan, finally brought her to where she could understand and receive ideas and concepts, and she worked with her diligently by touch and squeezes so that she could learn how to write and how to communicate, she also came to know about God and about Jesus Christ. And Helen Keller said, and I quote, I always knew there was a God, but I never knew what to call him. Helen Keller had a few of the blessings you and I enjoy. But listen as she describes the meaning of Christmas for her in an essay titled A Christmas Legend. She writes, and I quote, A legend tells that when Jesus was born, the sun danced in the sky. The aged trees straightened themselves and put on leaves and sent forth the fragrance of blossoms once more. These are symbols of what takes place in our hearts when the Christ child is born anew each year. Blessed by the Christmas sunshine, our natures, perhaps long, leafless, bring forth new love, kindness, new mercy, and compassion. Here's a thought as we close. Could you find joy and give thanks this Christmas if you were deaf, blind, and unable to speak? Helen Carroller knew a joy that few people have ever or will ever attain. She learned how to lay aside every anxiety and in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present her request to God. Rejoice in the Lord always writes, Paul. I will say it again, rejoice. Let, your ev let gentleness be evident to all. Here's the last thing. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, present your request to God. Then Paul, at the prompting of the Holy Spirit, makes us a promise. 
A few chapters over, he writes, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May it be so this Christmas for you and yours. Church, here's the deal. Some of you are sitting next to empty seats. On the 24th, you'll have an opportunity to share the love that you know in your heart with somebody who's not in this room. I would challenge you that you would pray, and the very person that you find may be tough and would not want to come here, that you would pray and say, Lord, give me wisdom and words so that those people would know your love and you'd be able to spread the joy that you know in your heart to a world that is hurting. Let's stand together and pray.